Okay, yeah. All right, so the plan is, I know that we are uh, very interested in talking about democracy, uh, and we are gonna get there. But before we do that, what I was thinking about, of taking maybe five to seven minutes and give you just uh, the gist of what the book is about. So I will start with that, and that will shape the discussion the way mm -hmm. that uh, people would be interested in wh wh whichever directions you, are, you want to take it. All right, so today uh, the nearly all humans live in large-scale complex societies organized as states. But such uh, organizations are quite recent in our evolutionary history. The human species has been around maybe for 200,000 years, but the states, the first states, appeared only 5,000 years ago, but they then rapidly took over the Earth. Now, yes, as, as uh, my team and colleagues have studied uh, using quantitative methods, the uh, historical dynamics of, uh, of past states, we find a very interesting pattern. So for some time, maybe 100 years, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, states actually can go with um, reasonable functioning keeping the internal peace in order and uh, generating reasonable well-being for their constituents. However, inevitably, at least in the past, uh, end times come. That's what the book is about. And these end times are these integrative periods during which states are very liable to fragmentation, to uh, outbreaks of political violence, uh, bloody revolutions, civil wars, and things like that. So think about as an example, so like the Russian Revolution that ended the Romanov dynasty and led to the bloody civil war or French Revolution, and uh, or the American Civil War. <coughs> so the big question that I'm trying to answer is why? Why do these end times come? And overall, by the way, overall there is a reason. There is not, it's not cycle, because it's not precise mathematical cycle, but there is a reason to this um, dynamics. So we have roughly a century or so of integrative dynamics and then roughly a century or so of disintegrative dynamics. Overall, two, 300 years. So today we live in such uh, turbulent times. The previous such wave of instability was, the, was known to historian as the age of revolutions, which peaked in uh, Europe during the revolutions of 1848 that spread across the whole um, uh, Europe. But at the same time, you had uh, the civil war in the United States, 1860 to 65, and the bloodiest uh, war in, uh, civil war in human history, the Taiping Rebellion in China, 1850 through 1864. So you can see it was a global um, uh, global uh, spread. And before that, there was a crisis of the 17th century, so on. So you see this recurrent um, uh, cycles. All right, why? One thing that we notice that the common feature uh, in the pre-crisis periods is what we call elite overproduction. Simply put, it's when there are too many elite wannabes who strive for a fixed number of positions in power. So in my book, I use the game of musical chairs to illustrate this dynamics. Imagine that instead of the usual game where you start with 10 chairs and 11 players, so instead of removing chairs, right, as players are eliminated, you don't eliminate players, you don't remove chairs, but you keep adding players. You start with 11 players, then 15, 20, 30, 40 players, but the same, 10 chairs. You can imagine how much of a uh, chaos and conflict this would uh, generate. It would also immediately uh, induce some people to start breaking rules. So for example, I would, instead of walking around, I would stop my chair, and then as soon as the music stops, I sit it, sit it. And then other people would figure it out. Each chair would gather a crowd of people pushing and shoving, and eventually, this could lead to uh, uh, a fist fight. So don't play this game at your next children's party. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, the basic uh, 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 
idea here is that some competition for power positions is good because it eliminates, you know, the uh, uh, foolish and uh, unlearned and so on and so forth. But uh, too much competition is corrosive. It corrodes the social cooperation. It also results in uh, breaking of social norms. And that can lead uh, eventually in real life uh, societies. It uh, usually leads to civil uh, wars. So um, because uh, the specific mechanism is, is that the, as the number of elite aspirants, right, elite wannabes increase, the number of losers becomes, uh, blows out even, uh, even faster. So initially there was just one loser, right? Then now if you have 40 players, there's 30 losers. There are 30 times as many losers. And some of them refuse to accept it and uh, start breaking rules. These are what we call counter elites. These are the people who organize uh, radical movements, uh, revolutionary movements. So Vladimir Lenin and Bolsheviks, uh, Castro and Los Barbudos, you know. So you think about uh, people of uh, this kind. All right. So um, the next question that we want to ask is why does elite overproduction develop? All right. Because uh, as I was saying during the integrated periods, during the good periods, we don't have that problem and then it develops. Well, um, this is uh, another interesting observation that when societies uh, work re uh, well for a uh, period of, of time, two, three, four generations, then um, uh, the um, uh, rulers of those societies. Actually, let me step back. First of all, who are the elites? Right? Uh, I've been saying that, but I use elites uh, in the uh, neutral sociological sense. These are simply the small proportion of the population that concentrates social power in their hands. Social power is ability to influence behavior of others. And social power comes in four basic flavors. It's uh, military coercive, it's economic, it's administrative or political, and the softest but very important source of power is persuasion or ideological power. All right, so um, the big question is that, uh, uh, that we, we need to ask about elites are what are the dynamics? How are elites uh, produced and reproduced? All right, and this is where we actually get to this um, uh, crux of the matter is that what are the forces that create too many uh, elite aspirants. So here is where we go back to looking at history. You see that after a good run of internal peace and order, what happens is that the ruling elites get so used uh, to being in charge. And uh, they become tempted to start rejiggling the economy and the society in their own favor. It's actually known as the iron law of oligarchy, right? It is very tempting for people in power to convert uh, their power into wealth at the expense of others. And that's what uh, happens over and over again um, in uh, history and unfortunately in our own uh, societies. So, so when that happens, typically the elites turn what I call the wealth pump. So the critical concept here is the wealth pump. What is the wealth pump? Well, um, uh, the wealth pump works differently in different societies. Uh, it's essentially rejiggling the economy in such a way that the majority of the population, the preferable 99%, actually lose ground and have declining um, uh, living standards or uh, stagnating or declining living standards. And, um, and instead, uh, the riches go to the elites. So in, let's say, uh, feudal times, uh, the lords, the landowners uh, would just squeeze the peasants, increase their rents, and then, um, and then um, use that for, for their own enrichment. In um, more modern societies, this is done more subtly by, uh, by uh, playing with the forces, economic forces of labor supply and demand for it and essentially depressing the price of labor, which is what the wages are. So in the United States, for example, we see this in the late 1970s. This is uh, what uh, happens is that prior to that, we see that um, the economy of GDP per capita 
or which is also very similar, uh, we uh, look at productivity of workers, right? And that is what has been growing, all right, until the late 1970s, and it keeps growing. But wages kept uh, uh, the same increase until the late 1970s, and they stagnated and even declined. So for many of the especially disadvantaged segments of the population, like um, unskilled labor, for example, and some others, uh, we see um, that they have lost ground, all right? They have their real wages are now less than they were uh, 40 years ago. All right, now what happens is that we now, uh, all that extra wealth had to go somewhere, right? So it, uh, this is what the wealth fund does. It pumps the wealth from the workers to their owners and managers of, uh, of businesses. And, that's, and so what we see uh, as a result of that is that over the 40 year period of time, the numbers of uber wealthy, so that's, well, that's specifically decabillionaires, but it's also the same at a billionaire level and, and, and lower. But people, the households that have $10 million or more in wealth, their numbers have exploded by a factor of 10. There are 10 times as many decabillionaires today as there were in, let's say, 1980. All right? Right. So now you would say, OK, that's uh, what's so bad about it. American dream, you know, people getting rich. Well, there are three problems. And these are each, each of these three problems is the driver of instability. The first problem is that uh, stagnation and uh, decline in living standards of the majority of the population that breeds a lot of discontent. And we can see that uh, in many measures in terms of um, biological measures, like the life expectancy in the United States started to decline. Uh, overall, life expectancy started to decline even two or three years before COVID, right? Um, but uh, the other very uh, you know, st strong result was the rise of the deaths of despair. So these are the deaths as a result of suicide or alcohol abuse, uh, drug uh, abuse, uh, and also more likelihood of getting into accidents and things like that. People just don't care about their life. And sometimes they take it directly, sometimes they take it by drinking themselves to death. All right, so that's one uh, problem uh, for the society as a whole because we are creating, we are creating large masses of population who are discontented that um, uh, the trust institutions is declining and they provide uh, raw energy. By, by themselves, as long as they are disorganized, they're not going to overthrow the state as long as the state is strong and the elites are united. However, here are the two other factors starting. First of all, by overproducing the wealth holders, what we have done, we have created a huge pool of elite aspirants. Not all uh, billionaires, of course, Want to enter the political arena, the, but the more uber wealth you have, the more such aspirants you have. So you have now 10 times as many um, aspirants for these public uh, positions. Of course, Trump is the <coughs> obvious example, but there are many others, such as uh, Michael Bloomberg, for example, or the famed aspirant Steve uh, Forbes. So there are many, many more wealthy people who compete for political positions, or some of them run their own candidates. We have now we have the illegal production problem, and the rules of the game starts breaking down. We saw that in 2016, right? 17 major candidates on the Republican side, unprecedented at that point number of major candidates, which was easily broken, uh, you know, four years later when there were 22 or 23 Democratic uh, major Democratic candidates. So this crowding of the field is the problem. Okay, and the third one is even more subtle. Now that we have this um, uh, 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 immiseration developing, and many people are becoming precarious. I don't know if you're familiar with this term. They're living very precariously, so that they, uh, any kind of medical emergency, for example, would break them. Uh, and they often don't have enough. You know, this is uh, mostly, I'm talking about the United States, but many of the states we talk about later are happening in Europe only with a time lag. So I was just uh, flabbergasted to read last week in the newspaper, newspapers that 10% of the poorest, 10% of many European countries' populations cannot afford to get food because food inflation was 
much, much more severe than our population. All right, so that creates the push factor for many of the uh, better, uh, not uh, more um, uh, no, smarter, uh, better organized, um, more ambitious people to get out. All right, and that, how do you get out? Well, you get uh, first college degree, but that's actually not that much. So you go for advanced degree, law degree, um, um, uh, 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 PhD, which is very close to uh, my field, and so on and so forth. Law degrees are particularly uh, dangerous because a disproportionate number of revolutionaries were trained as lawyers. Again, Lenin, Castro, um, um, uh, Robespierre, um, uh, Lincoln, by the way, um, Gandhi, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, um, uh, in the United States, we overproduce a law degrees by a factor of three to one. And three times as many law, de law degree graduates as uh, their positions for them. And with AI, there's an estimate that about half of the lawyer jobs are going to be automated. So very soon it will be six to one. You can imagine, this is the game of, uh, of elite uh, chairs, you know, in, you know, uh, in, in, in a very high intensity. All right, so these three uh, factors, uh, immiseration, overproduction of wealth holders, and overproduction of youth with advanced degrees, are the drivers of instability, which we see historically during the revolutions of 1848. They were driven, uh, were, all those revolutionary radical groups were surplus students. Lenin and uh, Bolsheviks, they all, you know, uh, in, 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 remember Bolsheviks is just one party. There were, uh, you know, 10 different parties, all radicals and all fed by, um, by degree holders. All right, the final thing uh, I want to say is that, all right, uh, what's next? Here is where our science of history is very important because what I've been talking about is a result of uh, serious scientific work where we gather tons of data, we run, we actually turn, uh, we uh, translate our uh, verbal hypothesis into computational models, and we run models uh, forward. So the way uh, to deal with uh, such complex issues is uh, to adopt a more engineering approach because human societies are complex systems with many interacting parts. It's if you try to do uh, some uh, interventions without uh, really tracing all the different ways that it can come around and bite you, right? And this is unintended consequence consequences. This is where you need uh, this uh, type of science. We are currently uh, finishing uh, gathering a crisis DB, which has about 200 uh, past societies over the past 5,000 years that go into crisis and then emerge from it. Because we, are, we, we not only want to know why societies get into crisis, right, but also how do we get out of it. And what we found is that the road to crisis is quite channelized. So it's like a narrow valley with a ball uh, rolling down and there's really only one way to go. But once you get to the crisis, it's a cost. You can go in many different directions. So in our database, maybe between 80 and 90% of societies, unfortunately, get into really bloody troubles, like uh, civil wars, you know, collapse, or maybe some other uh, neighbors taking them over uh, in a uh, catastrophic war. Uh, but the, uh, the good news that 10-15% uh, of societies actually managed to, they got into these this revolutionary situations, but there was never a revolution because the elites pulled together, uh, co collaborated with the population, so in the book I talked about several examples. One of them is that um, in the first 30 years of uh, 20th century United States, this is the progressive era and the New Deal. It takes time, unfortunately, to solve these problems. Another one is the UK, uh, the Chartist uh, period. So UK was uh, the only major European state that avoided revolutions in 1848. They managed to resolve it by the right. Before they shut down the wealth parties, actually. So there are several examples of this kind. And so we can learn from them. But um, final thought I will leave with you here is that this is science. And so science that doesn't never pretend that you know everything. 
right? And our science is not as well developed, it's still new, it's not as well developed as the material science that allows us to deal with regions, right? So we need to do much more work to get it better. But uh, on the other hand, some of the insights that we are uh, getting from this, I think, are workable. Uh, provide us not with uh, solutions, but with ways of thinking about how we can get the solution. So I think I'll stop here, and I'm happy to, uh, to throw this either for guided discussion. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. Super explanation. So before we go to the table discussion, the overall discussion, uh, there's plenty of opportunity for applause as well. But anyway, great job. Uh, can you just, uh, anyway, just stepping back slightly, explain how, what gave you the idea of applying all of this complexity theory to human societies, just to see, I suppose, it, on an issue just working on a hypothesis, what made you think, oh, you know, I'm just going to try to see if I can model in some way, you know, the experience of all past societies and see if uh, there's a pattern? Well, it was a kind of a midlife crisis. I, uh, <laughs> I um, <coughs> uh, got my PhD in biology. I was actually a complexity scientist from the very beginning, but I was studying population systems, population cycles, what's known as chaos and things like that. Um, and then when I hit 40, I, uh, I, was, I got tenure, promoted uh, to the next uh, rank of the professorship, and so the typical route would be for me to divorce my wife and marry a graduate student, but I, I love my wife, I didn't want to do that. So instead I divorced uh, biology and married uh, this new uh, science. Uh, we call it Clio Dynamics. Clio is the muse of uh, history, um, and um, dynamics is the science of change. Essentially, um, I, I felt a lack of challenge. You know, it was, pre, uh, it was fairly clear how things will develop uh, in uh, theoretical biology at this point, and I wanted to ch have a challenge, and history was the last discipline which has not been yet uh, subjected to mathematics and also scientific method. Now, nothing, I have nothing against traditional historians. In fact, I have only deep admiration for them. And in fact, without their work, we would not be able to do what we do because they are the ones who provide us with data. Um, but they, they, their interests and goals are different. But especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, historians think of themselves as not scientists, but as humanities scholars. So they're not interested in testing theories. They do uh, pro uh, pro uh, provide explanations. Of course, you know, you're, the, everybody you write, uh, there's like hundreds of books about why Roman history uh, collapsed, and each one of them uh, proposes a different explanation. One German historian counted that, and it's like 200, 230 different explanations. And since he did that, there's been more. All right, so explanations multiply, but they don't get um, cut down. In science, uh, 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 rejecting bad hypothesis in, f in favor of good hypothesis is the critical part. That's why we don't have the theory of logistone. Right, because it's a rejected theory, it didn't work. Yeah, or uh, Lamarckian revolution, uh, evolution, lost to um, Darwin uh, ideas of evolution. And so the idea is that, but we need to know what, why previous societies uh, collapsed, all right? And also we need to know why, how they managed to get out of it. And that means that we have to, uh, to find the right explanations, and that means testing theory. So that's essentially how I got around it. And it, initially, I didn't want to go into <coughs> contemporary societies because I knew that uh, this would be a stepping in a political minefield. So I wanted to, to uh, study you know, Rome and Egypt and China. Um, <clears throat> but every time I give a talk, uh, gave a talk then 20 years ago, uh, I was uh, asked, OK, where are we? You know, and, and so finally I decided to, to study it. And to, truthfully, when I did this in about 2008 or so, I was shocked because all the, um, all the um, signs, all the um, uh, leading indicators uh, of crisis in previous societies were pointed in the same direction, which is why mm. I, I uh, published this forecast in 2010. So you mentioned... Um uh, you mentioned earlier and gave us some U.S. examples that most of your work has been in the 
on the US. And have you also applied your theories to other large you know, democracies, not necessarily in Europe, but India or China or Russian or Russia? Yeah, so initially uh, we studied a number of historical societies. So at this point we have maybe 30, between 30 and 40 well-studied cases uh, spread uh, through mostly more uh, near like 19th century crisis, 17th century and so on. Um, of the uh, uh, contemporary societies, it, um, I, uh, we, the best studied case is the United States. But um, right now, um, uh, my colleagues and I are uh, applying this to, uh, to, uh, to other contemporary societies, and obviously we want to see what's happening in Europe. One thing is that um, even within Europe, there is no such thing as Europe from our point of view, because each country uh, has to be treated separately. Uh, remember that uh, elite reproduction is the critical part of theory, and different countries have different um, approaches uh, to, to that. So in the United States, the wealth is uh, really the, the um, dominating power, which is why I, I argue in my book that the United States has now, by now become a plutocracy. All right? But in, um, let's say, let's take another example. Fran in France, wealth is not terribly important. In France, it's the credential route. Right, you um, you go to uh, one of the the grand écoles, uh, you learn how to write an elegant essay, you become sort of you know uh, it's it's very much like mandarins in China in many ways. Actually, France and China in this respect are more similar than they, than they are to the United States. All right, so what that means is that each con each country uh, has to you have to apply this uh, the, the general model works at an abstract level but to apply it to a country you have to tailor it all right so to answer your question we are just in the beginnings of this and unfortunately uh, the uh, european research council and some other funding bodies have not been terribly sympathetic to <laughs> our efforts and, and it requires a lot of work as you can imagine so right now things are moving very slowly Mm -hmm. But we can talk about specific countries because even though I don't have as good body of data to talk authoritatively about various European countries, I've been sort of looking into uh, places like Sweden, for example. You know, Sweden uh, turns out to be a very interesting case. We can talk about that uh, 